Well, the narrative continues, and God keeps running interference on God's people as they veer off the track this way or that way, and, or they get stuck in a terrible situation and need to be rescued. And this time, it's the second one. They're stuck. More than stuck, they're enslaved, oppressed, trapped, powerless. And this is what gets God fired up the most, humans oppressing other humans. It's the worst way to fail our divine calling when human beings loved by God use and abuse other human beings equally loved by God. It's an insult to God. It's saying to God's face that God's love is meaningless. God's love for those persons we oppress and God's love for us. This story of the exodus from slavery is a sacred text for understanding God as liberator. The story has been a touchstone for oppressed peoples across the ages, for enslaved persons from Africa, for Jews during the Holocaust, for campesinos in Latin America, even Muslims revere this story. Prophet Moses is named more than any other individual in the Quran. His role in the Exodus is an inspiration wherever Muslims are oppressed today. So what happens in this story? If you recall from my sermon last Sunday, Joseph, the ancestor of these enslaved Hebrews, played into the hands of Pharaoh and the Egyptian empire and helped them set up a system of oppression during the Great Famine. Now Joseph's actions have come back to bite his own people, generations later. Sure, Pharaoh would have been oppressive without Joseph's help. Nevertheless, by this time, Pharaoh's treatment of God's people is beyond the pale. So God steps in to punish the oppressors and liberate the oppressed. Ten fantastic stories we call the Great Plagues get the Hebrews to the place where we find them today in Exodus 12 and 13. They are about to be pushed out of Egypt. Egyptians see the Hebrews as the cause of their suffering and want them gone as far away as possible. So this story is about their last night in Egypt and their last meal together as a community and the first Passover feast. God, the avenger, went through the land with the final plague of death, but passed over or spared those who splashed the blood of a pure lamb on their door jams. Strange ritual to us but made perfect sense to a culture that did animal sacrifice. In the Passover, God is on the move. Everything about the Passover story points to a God that will not sit still, and God doesn't want God's people to sit still either. They bake unleavened bread for the very practical reason that they are in a hurry. They couldn't sit for hours and wait for dough to rise. They had to mix, bake, eat, and run. God was on the move. God was doing something that night that they would remember forever. God was liberating the people of Israel from the bonds of slavery. Everyone, Hebrews and Egyptians alike, were in a hopelessly stuck and static narrative where everyone's survival depended on status quo depended on the oppressors staying in power and on the oppressed staying in bondage. They had forgotten, or had never known, the God that called Abraham and Sarah to become nomads, to give up being rooted and stable and to go to a place that God would show them. The Exodus is kind of like Abraham and Sarah revisited, but on a larger scale. God was moving, and the Hebrews were encouraged to join that movement and go into the wilderness, only God knows where, and discover how to be utterly dependent. So in Exodus 12, the Israelites eat on the run. 
they have fast food for dinner. Because God is moving quickly, and they have to hurry to keep up. Did you hear Moses' detailed instructions? Not only was the bread unleavened for the sake of speed, even the meat preparation had to be efficient, no leftovers to hassle with. If one household was too small to eat a whole lamb, they had to share with a neighbor, so there was enough but not too much. And eat the lamb and bread, Moses said, with your cloak tucked into your belt, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand. Eat in haste, for it is the Lord's Passover. It's not too hard for us to picture that. Think of the way enslaved people in this country might have eaten their food on the Underground Railroad. Food in one hand, knapsack in another, eyes up, looking for bounty hunters, shoes on their feet, almost crouched and ready to run. So what can we take from this story today, this notion of fast food and God on the move? Does it relate to our Lord's Supper? Our ritual is different, of course. We might call communion a grandchild of the Passover, since Jesus and his disciples were eating the Passover meal at their Last Supper. One thing is similar. At the communion table, we also eat on the run. The God who invites us to sit at the table is a God on the move, as God always is. God has a mission to restore shalom in a broken and sinful world. The mission is urgent. Not saying we need to rush through the ritual, but the Lord's table is not a place to take up residence. It's not a place to stay and overeat. Here we eat lightly and move on. The Lord's table is a place to be refreshed and renewed so we can leave the table immediately after the meal and go about our work of sharing God's liberation and salvation. We eat on the run, so to speak. The focus of this meal is not inward, it's outward. The movement is that way, not this way. We are a missional church, and this is a missional meal. We eat not to stuff ourselves, but to celebrate liberation in Christ. So I invite you, as you prepare to partake of this meal wherever you are, to consider what it means to sit at this table with a God on the move, especially now when so much of our world and our lives are in turmoil. We crave stability and predictability. Whether it's in your own life or in the life of our church or in the life of our nation, wherever you might be clamoring right now to manage, control, to fix something into place, but God might be saying, trust me, Stay with me as I move into the wilderness. Stay with me. I know the way we are going. God is on the move, and we are joined to God in mission. So we come to eat and drink and be renewed. But don't come to stay. Come to go. Receive, then give. And remember, we're not eating this meal alone. Today is World Communion Sunday. We join with Christ's body everywhere to celebrate God's saving, liberating work in Jesus. We're all on the move, all together. Godspeed. God be with us. To help connect us to Christ's body that enfolds many cultures and tongues, we will again read a bilingual Eucharistic prayer as we have on previous World Communion Sundays. This traditional prayer before communion is in both English and Spanish and switches back and forth, but not always in translation. And to help us connect to our own scattered body here at Parkview, we will be reading along with ourselves. 
a recording of us last October, last World Communion Sunday, when this sanctuary was full of people. So read along if you wish, or if you just want to listen to the sound of our gathered voices from last year, that's okay too. And after this prayer, Pastor Paula Stoltzfus will give you instructions on how to partake of the communion at home. Follow along now on the screen or, or your printed order of worship, and you will hear me read the English light print and Peyton Herb read the Spanish light print, and all of us together read the bold yellow print in both languages. Let us pray together. The Lord be with you. And also with you, y también contigo. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Los hermanos al Señor. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. Es digno y justo darle gracias y alabarle. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, almighty God, creator of heaven and earth. You have made from one every nation and people to live on all the face of the earth. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Santo eres tú, y bendito es tu Hijo, Jesucristo. Mediante el bautismo de su sufrimiento, muerte y resurrección, Diste nacimiento a tu iglesia. Nos liberaste de la esclavitud del pecado y de la muerte. E hiciste con nosotros un nuevo pacto, mediante el agua y el espíritu. Nos comisionó ser sus testigos hasta el último rincón del mundo y a ser discípulos de todas las naciones. Y hoy su familia en todo el mundo se junta alrededor de tu santa mesa. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples, and said, Take, eat, this is my body, do this in remembrance of me. Tomad, comed, esto es mi cuerpo. Haced esto en memoria de mí. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples, and said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. Esta copa es el nuevo pacto en mi sangre. Hace esto todas las veces que las bebieres en memoria de mí. And so, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Mediante el poder de tu Espíritu, haznos uno con Cristo, uno con los demás, y uno en la obra del ministerio a todo el mundo hasta que Cristo venga en la victoria final y podamos todos participar en el banque banquete celestial. Glory to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. Gloria al Padre, al Hijo, y al Espíritu Santo. 
como era en el principio, ahora y por los siglos. Amén. Amén.